John Belushi was born in the suburbs of Illinois in 1949, the oldest of four children. I think to understand John Belushi's childhood, you have to understand Wheaton, Illinois. Now, think of the most conservative town you've ever been, and then times that by five, and that's Wheaton, Illinois. His grandmother doesn't even speak English. She's from Albania, and he sort of has to pantomime and play charades with her to communicate with her. So there's this fascinating sort of origin of his physical comedy just by uh, communicating with his grandmother. Jo Animal House was the highest grossing comedy of all time at this point. Now, now think about 100 years of American movies and really kind of contemplate what that actually means. But While attending college just outside of Chicago, John forms the comedy troupe West Compass Players. He is soon discovered by Bernard Sollins, co-founder of the famed Second City Improv Theater. Belushi is just 22 years old. If you think about Second City's origins, it's from the University of Chicago. It's this highbrow, intellectual, philosophical discussions. And then you have this guy come around and just literally attacking the stage. Delicate, patient, finesse was not his strong point. His strong point was inspiration, enthusiasm, and a certain kind of recklessness where he just threw himself into things. John Belushi auditions for Bernard Sollins for Second City, and he claims that it was the best audition he'd ever seen. And just bumped him from step one to step stratosphere. On stage, audiences are discovering John Belushi's comedy. John was the kind of guy that people were drawn to. He just had that magnetic animal charisma that people just couldn't look away from. Meanwhile, backstage, John is discovering new ways to be funny. Second City, just like everywhere else in the early 70s, was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Drug use was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. Everyone was doing it. When you work in an environment where drugs are par for the course, there is pressure. You can't suddenly say no because everybody's doing it. So the danger there is because everybody's doing it, you may not even see it as detrimental, and you may normalize it. At Second City, John meets Del Close, the legendary comedy coach who will become a powerful influencer on the young comedian. You have to understand this guy, Del Close. He was the guru. He was this man who kind of came from that 60s generation. He thought drugs were necessary to expand our understanding of the world. Del was one of these people that really lived on the edge. He really ate danger for breakfast. He was a tough guy. And Del Close is telling him comedy is aggression. Comedy is not about making feel good. Comedy is about killing. Comedy is about rage. And Del Close is manic and spitting in his face and screaming. I had Del Close as a teacher. That's the way he was. I'm sure he had an effect on John. Artistically he did, but I also think psychologically he did. John didn't have a relationship with his own father, so having somebody that loves the same thing he loves and telling him drugs are something that he needs to do to expand his comedy, that's a real big watershed moment for John Belushi. Under the influence of Del Close, who would ultimately be fired by Second City due to drug use, John is encouraged to experiment with mind-altering substances before his performances. Del Close experimented with virtually every drug, but particularly something like LSD. He felt like that would completely push our boundaries and let us explore new things. It's a very much a teamwork-oriented process improv. I give you something, and you throw some more spice in the soup, but we're making a soup together. <laughs> I think for John, he liked to be the head chef. He liked to be the one that kind of called the shots. And at times, that caused some problems because his comedy was very much take over the scene kind of thing. So if you were in the line of John when he was coming at you to, to make a physical joke, you know, you just had a grin and bear it. It was like playing football. He was pulled aside by some of his mentors and older members of the cast and said, John, look, you know, this is a team thing, and this is the way we do this but no one seems to mind as long as the audience is laughing. Bernie Silence turned a blind eye to the drug use. He understood that his people needed to sort of do that to stay on and it filled the seats. John always delivered a good performance. He never missed a show. He never missed a rehearsal. John is becoming a big star and an audience favorite at Second City. John Belushi lived his fantasies at Second City. That was a charmed experience for him. And I don't know that that can ever maintain itself for an entire life or an entire career. In 1973, John Belushi is scouted by the comedy team behind National Lampoon. The 24-year-old comedian heads to New York City to star in the off-Broadway production, Lemmings. The cast of National Lampoon's Lemmings included uh, Chevy Chase, 
Christopher Guest and John Belushi. It was funny and, and smart, sort of a faux rock concert. It just it was very fresh and very clever, and, and, and everybody on it was very musical and very uh, able to imitate other people, you know, do Joe Cocker. John Belushi's spot-on impression of blues rock singer Joe Cocker became one of his most iconic characters on SNL. He was very serious about developing material. He perfected Joe Cocker for years, the whole spinning and falling down. As it's clearly seen in this performance of Lemmings, his Joe Cocker character was well-developed prior to SNL fame. He would perfect this physical floor performance seen here on the Lemming stage throughout his career at SNL. Helming the ambitious production is Tony Hendra. Tony Hendra was a director, and he kind of had an eye for uh, putting people together. And he was part of that kind of scene, a little older than the guys, and a little bit of a mentor to them, a little bit of an enabler for them. The pattern of Belushi's directors encouraging his drug use to enhance comedic performance continues in New York City, a place where future comic Chris Farley will also encounter dangerous enablers. One bad influence can lead to the next. John Belushi has been under the influence of Del Close at Second City, a dangerous mentor that future young comic Chris Farley will meet one day as well. In 1973, Belushi is starring in the off-Broadway play National Lampoon's Lemmings in New York. And just like in Chicago, he is surrounded by people who have a damaging influence. Tony Hendra had this little thing called the, a drug tax. Businessmen wanted to be hip. They wanted to hang around with the cool young guys in, in New York City. So what he would do was shake them down for money, a couple hundred bucks here and there. Hey, this is for the guys, and this is for us to smoke weed. But he'd actually buy Coke instead. When John Belushi discovered cocaine, everything changed. So cocaine was the engine, man. This let him do and create and think and thrive and also maintain his nightlife. And so this drug solved a lot of his problems in the, in the, in the short run. Cocaine gives you the energy, it gives you euphoria, it makes you high, but also you develop tolerance to it. What that means is you need more and more to get the same fix. It's an addiction just waiting to happen. It is reported that Hendra felt Belushi's comedic timing was off when he was high on cocaine and needed to be tamed. What goes up must come down. Coming down from a cocaine binge is probably the most awful hangover, just soul-sucking awful thing. So Quaaludes help with that process. John Belushi is on a chemical roller coaster ride. Another thing that can happen is something called state dependency learning. For instance, if John Belushi were to write out a sketch when he was high. When he was delivering it, he would need to have a similar high. Otherwise, he may not be able to recall a lot of that material. So if your brain thinks you can't have one without the other, it creates a bit of a dependency. TV producer Lorne Michaels sees Lemmings and loves Belushi's performance. He casts him in a new late night show he's working on that will come to be known as Saturday Night Live. With SNL, comedy became a huge part of pop culture. John Belushi and those original cast members were the stars. It became that water cooler kind of show where people were talking about it on Monday morning. It became something that was a cultural phenomenon. John Belushi's impersonations and characters on SNL are some of the most revered of its entire history. Everyone was happy for John because he was so happy. I think he knew that his friends were rooting for him. John Belushi becomes such a special part of that comedy troupe because nobody on that cast can quite sort of take ownership of physical comedy the way he can. National exposure brings John a new level of attention and a larger circle of enablers. When he started becoming well-known on Saturday Night Live, he could not leave the house without being recognized. And not only that, but people would press vials of cocaine into his hands. This is something kind of new here from this kid that's used to making kind of scrapping by for minimum wage. All of a sudden, he's a big, big star. 
The Saturday Night Live schedule proves to be another level of intensity for John Belushi. They had to write the show very quickly. They had to perform, build sets, the kind of show where you're up for three days at a time. The whole thing was just this absolute tornado of a, of a production. So cocaine was the fuel that fed that whole thing. There would be no Saturday Night Live without cocaine. Every Saturday night, you're gonna go live to an audience of 20 million people, and you have to make them laugh. And right backstage, if you do two lines of this white powder substance, you can almost guarantee the confidence to do a great performance. John is working six nights a week at SNL, and the drugs he's using to sustain his energy are taking a toll. At first, cocaine was a recreational thing for him, and then that evolved to, I need cocaine to perform. That evolved to a full-blown addiction that completely changed his personality. So that third step began to happen when he was on Saturday Night Live. If it's part of your work environment, you just don't know when to put on the brakes. By 1978, 29-year-old John Belushi has the world in the palm of his hand. He is ready to make a move beyond his hit TV show. John Belushi wanted more. He wanted to go from the small screen to the big screen, and Hollywood was calling. He started making hit films like Animal House and The Blues Brothers. By 1980, John Belushi is a star on stage, on Saturday Night Live, and on film. With his creative partner, Dan Aykroyd, he has a hit record and movie with their characters, the Blues Brothers. John Belushi having the number one album, the number one TV show, and the number one movie. People expect him to knock it out of the park every single time. Under pressure and under the influence of a serious drug habit, John is starting to get a bad reputation on set. He became an unpleasant guy to be around at times when he was on drugs because coming down from cocaine changes someone's personality. So John is holding a production. There are days where there are 100 people waiting around to do a scene and John won't come out because he's not on or he doesn't have his drugs. So this isn't that fun-loving guy that we, that we used to know. This is somebody that's become a real prima donna and a real problem. John Belushi's next two films do not come close to matching the success of Animal House and Blues Brothers. John Belushi really tried to break out of the character in which he was known for, that slapstick comedy. And with Neighbors and Continental Divide, he approached characters different than what audiences, I think, really wanted to see. This guy that was on top of the stratosphere for years all of a sudden makes two bombs in a row, and he's feeling it. He's feeling the pressure. In 1982, John Belushi's career is plateauing, but he is working on a script for a new comedy about wine called Noble Rot. He believes that this is the project that will turn his career around. And everyone that reads this doesn't like it. They don't think it's funny. John just can't believe it. He's like, who are you to tell me what's funny? I'm John Belushi. And that can be cold water in your face. You know, that probably didn't happen to him a lot. Belushi finds out that they've rejected the rewrite on Noble Rot. He immediately heads to LA for meetings. He's going to go pound that script into the faces of these big Hollywood heavy hitters. But Los Angeles is not a safe place for John Belushi. It is full of temptations, and John surrounds himself with enablers from all walks of life. A bad influence and a celebrity can often be drawn to each other. John Belushi was a rock star comic who was surrounded by enablers. Those same types will come out of the shadows for a piece of another young comic, Chris Farley, 15 years later. When John Belushi's movie script is rejected, he flies out to Hollywood in a rage. After frustrating meetings with movie executives, Belushi calls an acquaintance to hang out. Kathy Smith was this Hollywood hanger-on that had sort of been associated with the band and Gordon Lightfoot, and she'd kind of knocked around Hollywood. Kathy had had a difficult relationship with drugs. She had become a heroin user while she was living in Los Angeles. Eventually, sort of gravitated to be a, a full-blown heroin dealer. She was known as the go-between in terms of getting the drugs for the celebrities. She would actually call herself the nurse and show up with a kit to help inject her friends or celebrities with their drugs. John Belushi and Kathy Smith start partying together in his suite, Bungalow 3, at the Chateau Marmont. 
John Belushi was looking for company and Kathy was more than willing. She had nothing else going on at the time. And I know she got a case of wine for them. And that's how the party started at the Shadow Marmot. Wine leads to drugs. John and Kathy start injecting cocaine. John Belushi is terrified of needles. She is an expert in injecting people, so she injects John. He becomes very dependent on her. If you inject cocaine, it hits you so fast that you're out of control. Even if it's too much, you wouldn't know. When you have enablers in your inner circle, they're always going to make excuses for your bad behavior. They're going to tell you it's perfectly OK, and they're not going to worry about your health. So having people like that around, how can you possibly quit? Under the influence of Kathy's drugs, John starts speedballing. Kathy and John, according to the public record, were doing speedballs, which were mixtures of heroin and cocaine. When you mix stimulants and depressants, it's a really deadly combination. You get rid of the side effects that would normally make you feel awful and stop so you keep going. But the high from the cocaine will wear down faster than the heroin. So you can almost have a heroin overdose with nothing kind of counteracting it. John and Kathy party around Sunset Boulevard. In the early morning hours of March 5th, 1982, the party continues in John's hotel room. My understanding is on the night that John Belushi died, there were a number of people in their suite. Robin Williams was there, Robert De Niro was there. John is kind of just not doing well at this point. He's starting to feel sick, and eventually it's just he and Kathy. At some point, Kathy makes a, a sexual overture to him. He's not having it. He reports that he's cold. He reports that he's not feeling well. Um, she sort of tells him to get under the covers. And then she kind of goes off on this very bizarre sort of mission, writing a letter to an old flame, ordering room service, just kind of forgetting that John Belushi is lying there suffering. She leaves about 10, 15 that next morning. Incredibly tragic that that was the last person in his life, and he needed somebody so badly that he even had to plead with her, don't leave me. It was very sad. John Belushi died alone in his hotel room. He overdosed on cocaine and heroin. Kathy Smith is questioned by police and let go. Kathy Smith was definitely in the wrong place at the wrong time. Kathy left LA and went to Toronto. She wanted to start all over again. But she just couldn't help herself. She had to take one last little shot at fame, and it was her undoing. I was sitting in my office, and this woman walked in without an appointment. She showed me a copy of that week's National Enquirer, which had a picture of her on it saying, I killed John Belushi. Kathy Smith is charged with first-degree murder in the death of John Belushi. She is eventually convicted for involuntary manslaughter and serves 15 months in a California prison. Kathy Smith's influence on John Belushi was so awful, it was deemed criminal. He had it all, and he just flew too close to the sun. John Belushi's comedy career only lasted a decade. In that time, he topped the music, TV, and movie worlds. John died before he realized his full potential before he could take stock of all that he had accomplished. As he became less full of enthusiasm, the thing that made John John, there was less of that person there. So we were sort of losing him in pieces until finally we lost him totally. 